First scripture reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy 6, starting at verse 5. Let me give you a little uh, lead up to verse 5. 1 Timothy 6, starting at verse 5. Starting at verse 3, Paul begins to uh, uh, help tide, uh, Timothy to realize what kind of people he may actually be up against. And so there are those, verse 3, who teach a different doctrine that does not agree with the sound words of Jesus, uh, that does, don't teach what accords with godliness. And then he begins to unpack some of their traits, puffed up with conceit, etc., and they produce envy, dissension, slander, and evil suspicions. And then he continues that plot in verse 5. Verse 5, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare and the many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith, Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he shall display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And now Exodus chapter 20 as we continue our series in the Ten Commandments, Freed People Living Free, Exodus chapter 20, starting at verse 1. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. O Lord, giver of all good gifts, in whom there is no flakiness or flip-flopping. Give us open minds to hear your word, soft hearts to receive your word, and ready hands to implement your word. For the sake of your inexpressible, lavish gift, Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. You may be seated. So for those who are listening in or those who are here, the There's uh, the points are on the back, along with some questions. There's uh, questions for the kids and for the kids. I've asked them to draw two pictures, and so I would love to have those pictures sent to me an email just to show me 
how they actually did those pictures and how you did those pictures, kids, and, and uh, be great. You know, sometimes it's humorous and at other times it's infuriating. Parents, parents often get to watch the image of God in their children, the image of God in their children at war with total depravity <laughs> and vice versa, right? So think about a playground. Two or three kids there together at a playground with their toys and one of them has something that the other child wants. So what do they normally do? Well, the one who wants it, you may have seen this or you may have done this as a kid in the playground, reaches across and grabs it, right? And takes it and tries to start taking it from them. Or I've seen this one on a time or two. The one who wants that other kid's toy starts to schmooze them out of it, right? Don't you see how you ought to share this? Oh, it would be really fun. I would really like to play with that, right? They try to schmooze them out of it. While at the same time, they hoard their own toys, right? The image of God at war with total depravity and vice versa. But then that very same child who was grabbing and schmoozing, maybe five minutes later or the next day at the playground, they turn around and offer to share their toys with their playmates for them to enjoy together. The image of God at total depravity at war. Now, I know that we've all grown up, and so we're so much holier and better than our kids were, or are. That's a joke, right? So the reality is, though, that those little kids are still in our hearts. And that war between the image of God and total depravity is still being waged. Especially as we find ourselves envying what others have or begrudging them their possessions. And yet at the same time, we can envy and begrudge, but turn right around and be ready to share a meal and share our tools. The war is real within us. And so this eighth commandment has loads to say about all of this in four simple words in the English. You shall not steal, which is only two words in the Hebrew. But these little words cover, at the least, there's far more that it covers, but at the least... You shall not steal covers private property, proper duties, principal business, poised contentment, patent enjoyment, and prolific generosity. Aren't you glad I stopped at six, right? There's far more it can do, but I stopped at six. So let's begin then, private property, you shall not steal. This eighth commandment turns on one basic presupposition. That very statement, you shall not steal, assumes the reality of private property. It's not expressly stated there, though it is repeatedly articulated through the rest of Scripture. But let me put it to you in a negative way. If there's nothing to possess, then there's nothing to pilfer. You see how that works, right? If there's nothing to possess, then there's nothing to pilfer. Therefore, if there's nothing to possess, there's no need for this command. The command is working off of the assumption God's own assumption that there's private property. And whether that private property is tangible, right? Is that private property tangible? Yes. It could be land. It could be money. It could be automobiles. In the present environment, it could be toilet paper. It can be candy bars, right? It's tangible, touchable. But that private property can also be intangible, like thoughts, like music, pirating music off the internet, or words to include even plagiarizing sermons. You shall not steal, the tangible and the intangible. And this is why the Bible pictures and describes a faithful community, a faithful community as a community that is about preserving one another's property, even lost property. Preserving one another's property, even lost property. Just two ch chapters later, in Exodus 23, verse 4 and 5. Exodus 23, 4 and 5. I'll just read to you verse 4. Look at how God puts it. If you meet your enemy's ox, not your dad's ox, not your sister's ox, your brother's ox, not your neighbor, your the guy you like, your enemy's ox. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. That's pretty powerful. I remember when I was a kid on the playground, 
you'd find something on the playground and there was nobody else around, you'd pick it up and inevitably somebody would come running across the playground with tears streaming down their face, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. And we were taught to chant back at them. You remember this? Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. That's nowhere in the Bible. It's nowhere in Scripture. And so, in God's order of things, there is no finders, keepers, losers, weepers. We're to honor that private property. Similarly, going beyond just that, God opposes robbery in other ways. Specifically, for example, the robbery of humans. Robbing them of their personhood or their life. In Exodus 21 and verse 16, just one chapter after the Ten Commandments, God himself says, whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Whoever steals a man. Notice that the preclusion is against slavery and sex trafficking and human trafficking, the, the co-opting of others and stealing their personhood. So, as you can see, God takes property seriously, whether it's tangible or intangible, whether it's inanimate or animate property, even personhood. This principle, personal property and its security, applies, or ought to apply, to every layer of society and state, to every level of community and country. Private property being preserved, our private property and others, is what sits behind and inside this edict. And there are other areas that this directive applies that often get passed over. For example, proper duties. So let me read to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, as we think about the eighth commandment. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 10 through 12, this is a young church. Paul was only with the Thessalonian Christians for just a few weeks, maybe a couple of months. And he was run out. And so these are young Christians. And notice what he tells them in 1 Thessalonians 4, 10 through 12. But we urge you to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Notice that whole concept, that part of preserving private property is you actually are involved in work as far as you are able, if you are capable, getting involved in work. Here's how Kevin DeYoung puts it in a book he wrote in 2000 called The Good News We Almost Forgot. Quote, when able-bodied men take handouts instead of doing all they can to work, they are robbing from others to feed their own laziness. It's a very hard statement, and yet that's the point of Scripture, is that if we are able, then we are intended to work. That's part of how we preserve our own and others' private property. It's an honorable thing to do. It's pr our proper duty. But then as you look at this passage again in 1 Thessalonians 4, 10 through 12, you notice that it also applies to the fact that we're to do the work we're paid to do. Right? He says that we're to work with our hands so that we may walk properly before outsiders dependent on no one. The implication is that we're to do the work we're paid to do. And so we're to fulfill our duties, which means we are also to work at principled business. Here's the third point, at principled business. And this theme of principled business comes up in several different ways all through Scripture from Old to New Testament. I want to give you a couple of examples. The first one is from Leviticus 19, verses 35 through 36. Here's what God says. You shall do no wrong in judgment, in measures of length or weight or quantity. You shall have, a, have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just Hen. Now those are all forms of measurement. You shall have used just measurements of some kind. And then notice how God attaches this to redemption. For I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Notice that, that the point is, is that we are not to cheat in our business deals. If I, if I put out a product and it says it's 16 ounces of bread, it better be 16 ounces of bread, right? That's the point of it, right? 
But notice how God ties it to redemption. He ties it to Exodus 20, verse 2. Think about it. Why is that huge and important? Because Israel, while they were in captivity, were not their own, right? They were cheated all the time. They never received what they deserved for their labor. And so God ties this redemption. When I redeemed you, I made you able then to actually be involved in principled business. It was part of the liberty I've given you. Extend this liberty to others. So we're not to be cheating in our business deal, deals. We're not to be overselling our product while we give out an underperforming outcome. We're not to shortchange our customers. But it also includes unfair wages or maybe specifically withholding rightful wages. Let me give you another example from Jeremiah 22, verse 13 through 17. I'm just going to read verse 13. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice. Well, how do you build a house by unrighteousness and build a room by un injustice? He goes on in the verse and he says, who makes his neighbor serve him for nothing and does not give him his wages. Notice that withholding the wages is actually uh, employing people unjustly and unrighteously, not to give them their wages. And you can see that as well in Amos 8, verses 4 through 7. But it comes out in James chapter 5, where James is talking to Christians who are employers. And James says to them, he says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you and the cries of the harvesters have reached the Lord of hosts. Principled business, right? That's the point behind, the, part of the point behind this commandment, you shall not steal. And it would include as well things like paying our bills when we can. Thankfully, Oklahoma City has backed off in some of those bills and several other organizations. But in the normal season, Paying our bills, I can't tell you how many people I've run across over the years who feel like they don't need to pay anybody anything. They just expect to get. We're to pay our bills as part of principled business. And so working at principled business is big in God's eyes. But so is having poised contentment. Poised contentment. And here I'm going to spend most of my time, as we're still thinking about the Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal, but I'm going to spend most of the, the rest of my time in the sermon to actually looking at 1 Timothy 6, starting at verse 5. So I would encourage you to flip over there again so you can pick this back up. I want you to notice in 1 Timothy 6 that Paul begins here with rich, the rich value of poised contentment. Now, Paul warns Timothy there in 1 Timothy 6, and he warns us that there are those out there who are producing envy and, um, and dissension, slander, evil suspicion. And then in verse 5, they also produce constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. There are some who are just utterly discontent and they want to do religion for the purpose of getting more somehow making more, somehow it will line their pockets better. And notice that Paul says that's not the right way to go. Instead, he challenges us with a profitable perspective. And it's the next part of the verses. But godliness with what? Contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world that we cannot take anything out of the world poised contentment. Then Paul goes on and contrasts contentment with its opposite. But those who desire to be rich, there's nothing wrong with being rich as we'll see in a, little, in a minute, but it's that yearning, that craving, that day and night, I've got to, got to, got to get more and have more, that desire to be rich, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people to ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. 
pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Part of our preserving private property, our own and others, part of our preserving what rightfully belongs to us and other folks is to start maintaining a poised contentment. Being satisfied. Being satisfied with God's providential care and not begrudging another. In fact, turning that around and beginning to rejoice in another's prosperity is immensely important. Can I tell you a story about myself, against myself? Years ago, when I was towards the end of my Air Force career, I was recruiting medical professionals, right? Doctors and pharmacists and uh, phlebotomists and others. And I had an office partner who only recruited nurses. This is the middle of the 1990s. I was just scrounging to find someone who would even talk to me, even recruited social workers, scrounging to, to find somebody who would talk to me and want to go in the Air Force. And it was like a desert land, right? And I look at my office partner, and he's got nurses calling him about every 15 minutes and coming in the door and saying, hey, I want to join the Air Force. And he's just sitting back all day long reading his USA Today newspaper, listening to his golden oldies, rock and roll station, doing nothing but just putting these people in. I was furious. I'm over there right next door to him, sweating and toiling and getting nowhere. It was in the midst of that, I started memorizing, I was memorizing the Westminster Shorter Catechism and some scripture because, of, because I was actually taking seminary classes at night at RTS Jackson. And I came to this, this part of the uh, catechism's discussion of the 8th, 9th, and 10th commandments. And in the Shorter Catechism on the Tenth Commandment specifically, it hammers home the evil of discontentment and the blessing of real contentment. And I felt horrible. So I did what you should probably never do. I went to my office partner. Now you've got to realize recruiting is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's kind of like used car sales, okay? I'm just telling you. And I go into my office partner and I tell him, put down the paper, turn off your radio station. I've got to tell you something. His name, I will just call him Olaf. Olaf, I just want you to know I have been envious. Of what? Of you. Why? Because you just sit there all day long and people come in by truckloads to join the Air Force through you and I'm over here dying over here. And instead, I, instead of being envious, I need to be rejoicing that you're that successful. Would you forgive me for being envious? I mean, I wouldn't necessarily recommend because it's kind of a private inside sin, but it was good for my soul because I was furious for months, angry at him. It wasn't his fault. Learning contentment, even to the point of being able to rejoice in another's prosperity. Poised contentment. And so having poised contentment then opens us up, opens us up to patent enjoyment. This is where we drop down to verse 17 of 1 Timothy 6. In a nutshell, notice that what, that's exactly what Paul requires of us. He says in verse 17, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Just as a side note, notice that Paul and no one in Scripture anywhere says that all Christians should serve, should give all their possessions in common permanently all the time. There should be no property. Scripture never says that the wealthy are to give away all the riches and become poor like everyone else. Nowhere. In fact, this is the way Joachim Dalma puts it in his book, his, commentary, his uh, comments on the Tenth Commandment. He says, the poor do not become richer when the rich become poor. When prosperity can be found nowhere, poverty will be found everywhere. So notice that God doesn't say, and through Paul he doesn't say, get rid of your riches. He says, enjoy them. Enjoy them with a real enjoyment. Right? Don't be proud. Don't be arrogant because riches come and go. Right? You, you didn't make yourself rich. Remember our passage we read in Deuteronomy 8 before the confession of sin. You really didn't make yourself rich. It was God's gift to you that you didn't deserve. Rejoice in that and enjoy what you've give, been given. A patent enjoyment. 
It is God who gives us all possessions richly to enjoy, Paul says. And so if that's the case, then Christians should be preservers of property, preservers of property who exhibit patent enjoyment. In the gifts that God has given us, we enjoy them, but most of all, we always look to the one who gave us the gifts. We enjoy him by the gifts he has given us. But further, we're to be then open-handed with prolific generosity. This is the last point, prolific generosity. It's right after verse 17. What does Paul say in verse 18 and 19? They are to do good, to be rich in good works, be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. We have received God's open-handed generosity. And so what are we to do? We're to reciprocate with open-handed generosity. That's Paul's point. Verse 17, we received God's open-handed generosity. So what do we do? Verse 18 and 19. We also have open-handed generosity as well. That fits exactly the pattern of the Ten Commandments. I'm the one who liberated you. Now, make that liberty available to others around you in the way that you treat them, etc. And it doesn't matter how wealthy we are, we should show prolific generosity. Here's what Paul says to ex-thieves. Ex-thieves, this fits in with the the Eighth Commandment, right? You shall not steal. Here's what Paul says to ex-thieves in Ephesians 4, verse 28. Listen to where he puts it. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. You should hear actually almost a summarization of this whole sermon in that verse. Right? Let me say it again. Let the thief no longer steal, but let, rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Prolific generosity. And so to summarize this last thought, There was a very wise and insightful social commentator who put this out just this last Monday. Her name, you may not know her, but but I know her. Her name is Denise Peabody. She put it out on Facebook, and it was brilliant. Here's what she said, just one sentence. I bet charities, food banks, churches will be hurting financially during this time of shutdowns. Don't, second, actually two sentences. Don't forget to tithe to your church and give to charities if you are able. What a, what a very clear and understanding statement, right? Because what's the tendency in a season like this is to hunker down and hoard, and yet there are plenty of folks and agencies out there that need our support and need us to continue to do what we were doing before. And it is, as Wes said, as he was talking about giving earlier, it is an act of faith. Lord, you're the one who provided us with this. And so we also respond with prolific generosity and open-handed generosity. So my friends, there's that ninth, or that eighth commandment, you shall not steal. This last point, prolific generosity, brings us happily to Jesus. Jesus, who richly has, and yet what did he do? He freely gave. He richly has, and he freely gave. You heard that in the assurance of pardon from 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he is rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And that, in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, is the backbone to all that Paul says about being generous givers. It's the gospel. Imagine Jesus had hoarded up and heaped up all that he had and never was never generous, right? And so the positive side, he didn't hoard it up, he didn't heap it up, but he lavishly gave up his rightful property for us. It was even in our confession of faith, just providentially, 
in Philippians chapter 2. Here he is in the form of God. He didn't flaunt it, but what did he do? He emptied himself and he humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death for us and for our salvation. Prolific generosity is at the heart of God. And we have benefited immensely. Let's pray. We thank you, O Lord, our God, that you have blessed us with property. We thank you, Lord, that you, um, you desire us to use this property well, to preserve our own and others' property. We, we ask you to help us to grow and flourish in, um, in full-blooded contentment, to have rich enjoyment of what you have blessed us with, but also, Lord, to remember who we have been blessed by and then to respond with the same kind of prolific generosity. Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus, who is the lifeblood, literally, of the prolific generosity. Thank you that you were not stingy and tight-fisted like some heavenly Ebenezer Scrooge. Thank you, Lord, and so we pray that you would help us. In Jesus' name, amen.